of the Lord forever. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. 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 Open up your Bibles to the book of Philippians. We've been going through the book of Philippians. And open it up to chapter 2. Verses 1 through 11. Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 11. Philippians 2 verses 1 through 11. You know we live in a world today where people are so caught up in themselves. We hear that expression time and time again. I got to look out for number one. And number one is not God to them. And number one is not you or somebody else to them. Number one to them is themselves. And we see people going on after all sorts of things that better than better themselves. And, and I'm not knocking better or bettering yourself or improving yourself. But we, should, we see so many people who are greedy in so many ways. And they're lusting after all sorts of selfish interests. They're pursuing only their own gain and their own welfare. And they have no concern for the things of God and they have no concern for the things of anybody else but the word of God calls you and I to be a different kind of person the word of God calls you and I to be separated from all that kind of self-centeredness and selfish uh, uh, self-aggrandizement and all of that attitude that's centered around self God calls us to be separate from that Rather, he calls us to a lifestyle of humility. As we look at this text this morning, we're going to see one simple principle. Simple but profound. Easy to state, hard to live by. And that's this. Be humble just as Christ himself. Be humble, just as Christ himself was humble. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we live in a world that's so filled with greed. Greed for selfish interests, greed for money, greed for power. Greed for whatever we want, oh God. So we need you to speak to us now. Because we know that you want us to be different from that, oh God. We know that you want us to be separated from those worldly <coughs> kind of pursuits and those fleshly kind of desires, oh God. But we know that you want us to pursue after the things of Christ, oh God. Not the things of this world. And so, Lord, we ask that right now you would teach us about humility and help us to become the kind of people that you want us to be, O oh God. And Lord, we also pray again that if there is somebody here who hasn't experienced your humility, O oh Lord Jesus, in their lives, what you did for them on Calvary's cross in their lives, that today would be the day that they humble themselves in front of you and receive you, Lord Jesus, as their Lord and Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What does it mean to be humble? It means that we seek to exalt God. We seek to lift Him up as the sovereign one. We seek to lift Him up as the one who is the Lord and Master, not only of this whole entire universe, but of our very own lives also. To be humble means that we deny ourselves as Jesus 
has said, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. It means that we deny our own selfish desires and our own self-centeredness and our own selfish pursuits, and we seek after the things of Christ. And we seek after things that benefit other people. The welfare of others rather than our own welfare. You see, when you live a life of humility, that lifestyle lifts up both God and other people. When you try to live a humble lifestyle, it's a lifestyle, you know what, in which you abandon self-confidence and you have in you rather God confidence. It's a lifestyle in which you put aside trust in yourself and you receive unto yourself or take unto yourself trust in the Lord. You see, the Bible says some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. Those are the people who trust in their own power and in their own abilities and in their own strength. But we, it says, as Christians, will trust in the Lord our God. So to be humble means that we put aside, we lay aside all of the things that are of this world and we seek after the things of God. It means that we deny, listen to this, means that we seek to deny self-will <coughs> and we pursue only God's will. On the night of April 3rd, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was speaking in front of a group in Memphis, Tennessee. One of the things that he said was this. It was a very simple but very profound statement. And it was a very humble statement. He said, I just want to do God's will. That was his heart's desire. And that's got to be your heart's desire. And my heart's desire also. Where I put aside, I ignore, I lay down, I reject my own self-will. And say, God. Yourselves. 
Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word for his name's sake. This text, these 11 verses here, call us to be humble just as Christ himself was humble. We have him for our pattern. We have him for our example. And we are to be just like him in this characteristic of humility. First, in verses 1 through 4, we see the exhortation to humility. The exhortation to humility. And that exhortation is based upon one simple fact. And that's this. Have you been blessed by the Lord Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. I don't know about you. I've been blessed by my Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in verse 1. It says there this. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, this word that's translated encourage here is a toughening kind of word. It, 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 it signifies a strengthening, a moral, a spiritual, many times even an emotional, and many times even a physical kind of strengthening that you receive from the Lord. Think about those times. You've been down and out, and you've been discouraged, and you feel you felt like you couldn't go on anymore. Maybe you felt like you couldn't even get out of your chair, or you felt like you couldn't even get out of your bed. You were just so despondent, and you were giving up on life, and you sought God out in prayer, and he sent down an encouragement to you, and he lifted you up. And he got you back up on your feet so that you could continue on and press on in your life. If there be any encouragement in Christ, it says here, it's a rhetorical kind of question. Because I think that all of us as Christians at one time or another, maybe even on a daily basis, have experienced encouragement and strengthening from the Lord. Jesus Christ. But there's even more blessing than that that we receive from Him. It says here, is there any consolation of love? Have you ever been comforted by him? Maybe you experienced the death of a loved one. And all of a sudden, you just felt Peace in the midst of that pain. Peace in the midst.
midst of that grief, you lost something that was close to you, whether it was maybe a spouse, or maybe it was a child, or somebody else in your family that you loved and that you 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 were, you you just really were very close to that person, and they died. And in your hour of pain and grief, God reached down to you and consoled you with His love. Maybe it wasn't the person that you lost. Maybe it was money that you lost. Maybe it was a job that you lost. Something that was dear to you. Something that, would, that you desperately really needed and it was taken away from you. And Christ came to you in that moment and wrapped His loving arms around you and gave you peace and calmness and comfort and consolation in the midst of that pain and gave you the ability to get through that trial. If there was any consolation in his love, of course there was consolation of love from the Lord Jesus Christ. If there is, it says, any fellowship of the Spirit, you know what? On a daily basis, you and I should be communing with God. You and I should be seeking God in prayer, seeking Him in Bible study, longing to hear from Him as He speaks to us through His Word, and also craving to speak to Him, to communicate to Him our deepest heart's desires, our deepest struggles, our deepest troubles. And then we have that fellowship, you see, with His Holy Spirit. And I would venture to guess, I don't know for sure, but I, I know for myself, I've experienced that. So when it says, if you've had any fellowship in the Spirit, it's not really an if, as if I'm questioning, maybe I had it, maybe I didn't have it. I know I've had that fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But it gets even deeper than that. Because look at what it says, moving on. It says, if any affection and compassion. Have you experienced Christ's mercy? Let me tell you something. When he went to Calvary's cross, there was mercy upon mercy upon mercy poured out upon you and upon me. You see, the Bible says that he was, as he was up there on Calvary's cross, remember when he cried out, my God, God, why have you forsaken me? The Bible says that God's eyes are too pure to behold iniquity. And so at that moment as Christ was crucified on Calvary's cross, God the Father actually turned his back on his own son. And as Jesus Christ was bleeding and suffering, and dying on that cross. You know what he endured? Instead of the love of his father, he endured the wrath of his father. He endured all judgment and all condemnation, literally all hell for you and for me. That's his love. That's his affection. That's says here this, if you have experienced any of those things, if you've experienced his encouragement, his consolation, his fellowship with his spirit, his love, his compassion, his mercy, then you know what? It is incumbent upon you to respond by living a humble Jesus did all that for you. What right do you or I have to then seek out our own self-interest and our own selfish desire? If he did that, since he did all that for me, you know what I need to do? I need to seek out his desires. I need to seek to do the things that he wants me to do. I need to seek and pursue his will and not my will. So, it goes on to say, in verse 2, that we need to be of the same mind, maintaining the 
same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, doing nothing. Actually, in verse 3, it doesn't say do nothing. It just says flatly there in the original Greek, nothing. It's like a, a word that's there that just bang, hits you in between the eyes. Nothing. Out of selfishness or selfish ambition or empty conceit. The word that's translated empty conceit there is an interesting word. It also can mean folly. You know what? If you pursue your own selfish desires and your own selfish cravings and your own self-interest, the Bible calls you a fool. Really? I mean, the, the biblical word that, that you know that is translated "fool." It, it's a, it's a, I'm telling you, it's, it's a, it's a strong word. It, it, it kind of means that you're like a moral and spiritual being. Really, that's the strength of that word. As you read it many times in the book of Proverbs, it means a moral and spiritual dunce. And if you pursue your own selfish interests, you know where those selfish interests land you. in eternal judgment in hell. All the people who are filled up with pride and could not and would not refuse to humble themselves before the Lord Jesus Christ, that's where they are. That is the end. That is the destination of those people. They're not doing good. They're doing bad. You think of all the greedy, self-interested people that you've read about, you've heard about, maybe that you've known, and they've never sought Christ, that's where they are. They're not better off than you. They're eternally worse off than you. And so it goes on to say, with humility of mind, the word that's translated here, humility, indicates a kind of lowliness. It's a powerful, powerful word. You know, in the ancient Greek world, there was not this Christian concept of humility. If you were humble, then you were thought of as being a weakling. You were thought of as being a pansy. You were thought of as being a doormat. And so they didn't speak in those terms. But you know what? The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we see what Christ did for us on Calvary's cross, it took that word, you see, and it elevated it and took it from a word that means somebody was a nothing. somebody who's something in Jesus Christ. You know, we got a lot of people in this world today that folks look down upon as nothing. You may have heard about the untouchables in India. That's not a gangster group or anything, by the way. Those are people who are so much looked down on in society that you're not supposed to touch them because if you touch them, you might get defiled by touching them. I was reading about some other country. Uh, they have a group of people there that they call the garbage collectors because those people collect garbage and they're kind of, to tell you the truth, in that society, they're even looked at as garbage. Let me tell you something about what is garbage. In the eye of the Lord Jesus, Christ, everybody is eternally important. Every human being has infinite value and infinite worth in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he died on Calvary's cross. And yet, he calls us here to live a lifestyle in which we are humble before Him. Humility of mind, look at this, regard one another as more important than the 
this out. Isn't this a concept that's totally foreign to the world that we live in? You know what that you know what that means? It means that I'm supposed to look at my wife and bring God on her. More important. You know who I'm seeing? This attitude of humility, and I, I'm not going to try to embarrass anybody, but I'm just going to say, I see it in Brother Dan. I see it in the way that he treats Whitney, and in the way that he's preparing for his baby to come. He puts them first. And I want to just want to encourage you, brother, just keep on doing it. Put them first. You humble yourself and you put them first. You put Christ first above all. God's going to exalt you. God's going to lift you. That's the way we all need to view one another. You know what? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a church where I look at Brother Larry Gary and I put him before myself. It's more important than me. And then he turns around and he, he, he looks at Brother John back there and he puts Brother John ahead of himself and before himself. And Brother John turns around and he does the same thing for Brother Larry Schrader. And Brother Larry turns around and he does the same thing for Brother Ed. And we all do that. We all look at one another and say, you know what? The other guy, the other woman, they're more important than me. Let me serve them. Man, what a church we would be. That's the kind of church that we need to be. You know why we need to be like that? Because that's the way Christ was to each and every one of us who's here. Look at what it says in verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, though he existed in the form of God. Here he is, God Almighty. The book of Colossians chapter 1 describes him as being the creator of the universe. Here he is, the creator of the universe. Here he is, the king of the universe. And he's God Almighty. And he's got all power. And he's got all of everything. And he's got all streets of gold and whatever it is that's up there in heaven. He's got it all. That's what it says in verse 6. But he goes on to say, you know what? He didn't regard all those things that he had with our Heavenly Father as something to be grabbed onto and held onto at all hazards and at all costs. He didn't regard those things, those privileges and those honors and those blessings and those uh, glories that he had up in heaven. He didn't regard them as something that he just needed to uh, hang on to and never let go of. But look at what it says here. It says that he, look at this, emptied himself. He gave up many of those honors. He gave up many of those privileges. He gave up many of those uh, 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 glories, you might say. You've heard of the so-called rags to riches story. This here is the ultimate example of a riches to rags story. He had all of those riches with his Father in heaven. He had all of that glory. He had all of that paradise. He took on the rag known as a human body. And he stepped down into the moral and spiritual cesspool that is planet Earth. Some of you may have read about the times into which Christ was born. We had Roman emperors killing family members. And you had all kinds of incest and wars killing hundreds of thousands of people. All of these things raging. That's the world that Christ stepped down into. That's the world from which he left his heavenly father and all that glory up in heaven. And that's what he came down into. He came down into a pigsty. I'm not trying to call anybody here a pig. Believe me. But when you compare, I'm just saying, 
thing by comparison. When you compare what he had to what he came down into, it would be like us rolling in the mud and muck and dirt and all the things. He emptied himself. And you see the steps here that are involved in that emptying. It says here, taking the form, look at this, of a bond servant. You remember when Christ was born, this is the king of the universe. You would think, okay, if he's going to come down to planet Earth, he would be born in the most fabulous royal palace, right? You would think that he would be born into an emperor's family, right? That maybe he would be the son of Caesar. But he was none of those things. He was born in a barn. His father, his earthly father, his human father, his stepfather, was a carpenter. His mother in society, she was a lowly nothing. They weren't emperors. They weren't royalty. They weren't zeros in society's eyes. They were nobodies. Became a boxer. The way the translators translate that word, they kind of candy coat it a little bit. The Greek word there is doulos. You know what it means? A slave. You want to be blunt about it? It says he became a slave. The king of the universe, the god of the universe, listen to this, became your slave. And my slave. Literally, your whipping boy. And my whipping boy. As he took that scourging right before he was crucified. And being made in the likeness of men. Going on into verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man. Look at this. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. Look at that word obedient. This is God Almighty. And he's got to obey. If Jesus Christ could be obedient to his heavenly father. How much more so can you and I be obedient unto him? And he didn't just die. It would be bad enough if he humbled himself, left his glory in heaven, came, became a man, became a slave, came down into this moral cesspool known as planet Earth, and died of an illness. Died of a sickness, died of natural causes, died of old age. That would be bad enough. But look at what it says about how he died. Even death on a cross. You know what that was to the Jews? The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, Cursed is he who hangs on a cross. So the Jewish people, the ones to, he, to whom he came down to first, they looked at him and saw him not as a savior, but as a man who was cursed by God. And he was willing to take that curse. For you and for me, the Bible says, I believe it's in the book of Galatians, For us. That should have been you and me. We should be the ones getting crucified for our sin. But he took that curse upon us. The Jewish world looked at it as something that was just worthy of all disgust. That was worthy of all contempt. And the Roman and Greek world, well, you know what? They looked at it as foolish. If you ever read about some of the Roman and Greek gods, you always see how they dress them up to look so nice. You know what's the ironic thing about them? On the outside, all of those Roman gods and Greek gods look good. Oh, Zeus, he, he's always depicted as in beautiful clothes and everything. And uh, all of the other gods and goddesses, Athena and all, they all look so beautiful. And there's a, 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 a what was it, the 
one who was perfect with his body and all of his muscles and what have you, he looked all so glistening and so mighty and so powerful. And yet you read about the mythology and you see how moral bankrupt those so-called gods were when they're committing incest with one another and they're trying to kill one another and they're killing people and lopping off people's heads and doing all sorts of wickedness to themselves and, and to other people. Dressed up nice. And the Greeks looked at that with pride and said, Those are our gods, the ones that look good. And so they would look at Christ as he was dying there on that cross, being having been punched in the face repeatedly, having been beaten with rods repeatedly, having been scourged repeatedly, having the nails pounded into his hands and his feet and a spear shoved up into his side. The Bible says that he was beaten so badly that he was beyond recognition. The Greeks looked at that and said, look at that bloody man on that cross. How could we worship and follow him? He doesn't look good. So to them, what Christ did was foolishness. But look at this. <coughs> because he was obedient. Look at what it says in verses 9 through 11. It says there this, that as a result of Christ's obedience, God exalted him. It says in the beginning in verse 9, this for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So you know what that means. You think of all that royalty. Their names are lower than his. Caesar's name is lower than Christ's name. Infinitely low. You name any president. You name any prime minister, any king, any royal family, any powerful person here on this earth, and their name is infinitely less than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God exalted it above every name. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, in verse 12, about that name. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Nobody else can save you. Nobody else can save you from your sin. Nobody else can save you from death. Nobody else can save you from hell. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. It's His name that you've got to call upon. The Bible says everybody who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. <clears throat> Look at this. Verse 10. At the name of Jesus, that one who is marred beyond our recognition, that one who is beaten and crucified, and had all sorts of other abusive things done to him at that name. Every knee will bow. This phrase, every knee will bow, is the ultimate abasement. It's the ultimate submission. That's the way the ancient mind looked at a knee bowing. You know what? When you came before one of those emperors, when you came before, let's say, the emperor of the Persian Empire, you didn't come standing up. You didn't come walking in. You didn't sit down in front of the emperor. You know what you did? You got down on your knees before him. As a matter of fact, ancient texts describe that if you came before the Persian emperor, many times you not only had to get down on your knees, but he would make you lie down flat face first, like this in front of him. And you know what? If he didn't want to talk to you, he could leave you there for hours. And if you moved, you got your head locked off. You stayed there prostrate like this. 
says here, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That's everybody. That's every single last human being that ever lived, that lives now, and that will ever live in the future. Nobody is excluded. Nobody escapes this day. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue, look at verse 11, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me read for you what it says in the book of Isaiah, the 45th chapter, verses 22 through 25. It says in this, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back. That to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance, and they will say to me, Only in the Lord our righteousness and strength. Men will come to him, and all who were angry at him will be put to shame. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel will be justified and rewarded. Let me tell you this. You can either bow now. You can either bow willingly or you will be forced to bow humbly. Many years ago, there used to be a commercial for Fram oil filters. And they used to advertise that you can buy this little Fram oil filter. And they used to have an auto mechanic showing it and say, you can either pay me now, three dollars I think it was, or you can pay me later in terms of expensive engine repairs that you will need. It's the same thing with you and your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can either bow now, willingly submit yourself now, or you will be forced to bow later at which time there will be an eternal cost to you. An eternal judgment of hell. The choice is yours. What will you do today? You know what? I believe that God is speaking to somebody right now. I believe he's speaking to somebody's heart right now. And he's saying right now, you need to bow to me right now. You need to submit to me. You need to give your life to me right now because I gave my life to you. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. If God is speaking to you in that way right now, and he's telling you, hey, you need to come to Jesus right now. I just want to invite you to just slip up your hand. Because I want to pray for you. I want to remember you in prayer. Is there somebody that God is speaking to right that right now? He's saying, humble yourself and submit to me right now. Don't wait. Tomorrow may be too late. You can walk out of here the next hour may be too late. You can walk out of here, you get hit by a car, have a heart attack, a stroke, or what have you, and automatically you'd be called to account before God, at which time you may be forced to bow unwillingly. Are you ready to be God? Well, you know what? I see that hand back there, brother. I see that hand. I see that hand. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Or maybe, you know what? At one time, you were walking with Jesus Christ. You were living the kind of life that He wanted you to live. But for whatever the reason, you turned away. And you started to live after your own selfish interests. 
maybe God is speaking to you right now. He's just saying, come on back. I love you. I'll take you back. Is there somebody that God is speaking to like that right now? You just slip your hand up also. I just want to pray for you too. God is calling the backsliders back to him. He loves you. We won't draw this out. But we want to give you an ample opportunity. Is there somebody? Let's go before the Lord in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, I just want to pray for this one who slipped up his hand right now. Oh God. He said he's coming to you, oh God. Lord, I just pray that you would help this one live for you, oh God. Lord, I pray that you would give him everything that he needs and that you would strengthen him, oh God, and bless him, oh God. Lord, we just all want to thank you so much for what you did for us, Lord Jesus, by humbling yourself and becoming a slave and not just dying, but dying the most horrible, gruesome death imaginable. And doing it for us. And paying the price on Calvary's cross for us. Suffering the punches, the rods, the whipping, the scourging, all the beating, the spitting on, all the humiliation, the nails pounded into your hands and feet, the spears shoved up into your side. All for us, Lord Jesus. We thank you. Thank you for your love. And help us all, God, to live the humble lifestyles that you want us to live. Help us to be humble as you yourself, Lord Jesus, were humble. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.